Life with Liliana and Friends. Hola Binaka and welcome to this evening's episode of Life with Liliana and Friends. And thank you to everybody that's been following along so far. We've gotten so many great comments, so many messages, and even more stories that have emerged because of some of the topics that we've been looking at. So for those of you that are new, that are joining for the first time, welcome. And I just want to remind everybody about the topic or the segment that we're under at the moment. And we've been looking at different stories to bring out some reasons why our children, our children here in Fiji are not thriving. So when I say thriving, I mean they are not as um, healthy and as, as, as successful as they can be. And there's a number of different ways a uh, number of different things, sorry, that get in the way of preventing our children from being the best they can be. So in the past episodes, we've looked at um, a number of stories. So we started off by looking at the story of our own family. So Edwin and I, uh, together with our children, Melania and Gideon, shared our experience of being in a blended family. Uh, we talked about co-parenting. Edwin shared his story. The kids came on and shared their perspective, and that was very eye-opening because the home environment is so important to ensuring that our children can be the best that they can be, right? So we looked at that, we got so much great feedback from that, and then we continued to explore other things. And just remember, I just want to insert here the key reason why we choose to bring up such topics that might be sensitive, um, things that we don't often talk about, the key thing is to educate us. So. First of all, to open our eyes to what's happening around us and things that are affecting us in ways that we maybe didn't realize. And we've learned that a lot of these things are not often spoken about. So we're a platform where we want to talk about the things that are not often spoken about. But once we're educated, then we need to think about, okay, what do we do with this information? We also want this information to be used to empower others that are in similar situations or may come across that situation in the future. But lastly, a very, very important um, intention of the show is to help us understand how we can help others who are in there. So we're living in a, I suppose we have a society that's very community-centric. And personally, I don't believe that we're meant to journey life alone. We all know that <clears throat> we often talk about, excuse me, how iron sharpens iron. We all talk about how important it is to have good people around you. And so this information that we see on the show or that we talk about is really intended to be used in that way. And so thank you to those who have been using it that way. Um, we also spoke about pornography. And so again, something else taboo that we don't often talk about, Letitia Shelton, um, who's been, who works in this space. She's a pastor based in Toowoomba came and spoke to us about it, opened our eyes to the, the size of the problem in Fiji, which is significant. And this is important, again, coming back to our children, because now they are exposed in ways that we never were when we were growing up. If you're like me and you're over 35 or over 40, pornography looked very different when we were growing up. But now with technology, it's so accessible, and it's also it's built into other mainstream things that they just come across without realizing. Then last week, or the last episode, which was a couple of weeks ago, we spoke to Mele, and Mele shared her story. She was so courageous. She shared her story about how she was raped as a young girl. She was raped at nine years old by her dad's, her, her friend's dad, sorry, uh, she went over for a sleepover, woke up in the middle of the night with her t-shirt up and her pants down and her friend's dad doing whatever he wanted to do to her. It was a heartbreaking story. But these are stories in Fiji and this is happening around us. And so it's important for us to be listening but also for us to be sharing. So please continue to share this. Now this week, we're still, again, looking at the same topic of what is getting in the way of our children, what is stopping our children from thriving. And so now we're gonna go into this um, space of crime and to look at um, you know, what our young children are doing, I suppose, um, that's getting them into prison or it's getting them into a life of crime. And again, this is something that's new for me, so I've invited my good friend, Philly Vossorongo, to come and talk to us a bit about this. Welcome, Philly. 
Thank you for making time for me this morning. <clears throat> Not naturally a morning person, but... And thank you for wearing this. your pink tie. Yeah, well, I, I thought that was Friday, uh, but I didn't realize that you, you had a, a floral as well. Yes, and they say real men wear pink. So this is a really big statement. Mm. Yeah? Yes. Well, if they don't say it, they say it now because okay. you've said it. And I also want to remind you that, as you know, Philly is also, um, he, well, he's a lawyer. He's also a um, politician. I don't know whether we call as no, he's a politician. And so we're also together on um, this new journey, but we've known each other for a number of years. And so um, I'm really thankful for for Philly, especially in this season, because I get to uh, bounce a lot of stuff off him. But we're going to talk about politics in another at another time, eh? mm. not today. But just remember, Philly, that I know that you're well known, but on this show, I'm the celebrity and not you. Okay. I'm good with that. So make sure you just remember that throughout the show. So I wanted to ask, you know, you've been well, you are busy, obviously, with your work and with other stuff that's happening. But you have been going to different groups. Um, youth groups I've noticed, and quite big groups you've been speaking to, um, and talking about crime specifically to the youth. Yes. So could you just help us understand, like, maybe a couple of things here, like what exactly you're talking to them about, um, but maybe just before that, why, why you are doing this, why you feel like it's important for you to go out, because this is of your own time and of your own resources that you're doing this. So can you help us understand that? All right, so the whole issue about um, this uh, community initiative that I, that, I, that I do is about crimes and how we want to communicate to our young people that crime doesn't pay. Mm. Now, that's, that's a very hard thing for me to be even doing now because I'm essentially a criminal lawyer and I, you know, my business, right. my business, is extracted out of representing uh, clients who are charged with crimes. Right. But I've been doing this for more than 22 years, you know, prosecuting crimes and then at this moment in time defending uh, crimes as a criminal lawyer. But, you know, it's essentially what you see in courts and particularly right. with young people. Right. Um, you're sitting at the bar, not, not the pub, the bar, the bar <laughs> in court. And so, usually the accused persons are either behind you or at your side when they come in. Okay. And it's, it's the ones that I usually call when they're behind you and you get to listen to the charges being read out and explained to them uh, without looking at them. And then you're looking at, oh, these are some serious crimes. And then, you know, you get tempted just for a bit to look back and look at them. And then you realize that, you know, the four people whose names have been called out are very young people. Wow. And you encounter this all so often that you begin to think, what are we going to do? Mm. Uh, and if there are people that are already doing things to try yes. and get our children um, to stop committing these crimes, then there's got to be something in us. And if we're able to, yes. to contribute to those, you know, to that uh, whole package of, of uh, just trying to get kids become aware of what activities, what things could be criminal, so that they understand it beforehand before right. you know they get into the right. getting into committing them. So that's essentially you know what this package is about. In fact, it's called Crime Doesn't Pay. Okay. Uh, so it's developed now into almost a thirty uh, slides of just explaining to kids and youths, uh, what conducts are described as crimes mm. and what other sentences you might be looking at. Right. So they get to know if they assault somebody, if they slap somebody, if they fight on the street, if they rob someone. What's the difference between robbing and aggravated robbery? So, and see. there's a difference in sentencing. So I give them definition of if you get into, if you uh, enter into some person's house, yes. into some person's compound, and then you get into the house. What sort of uh, offenses you are committing in the process? Yes. And what are you looking at at the end? So generally, once you start talking to them about that, 
it starts generating, generating questions. And so we get the chance to clarify it with them as well. Mm. I also have a chance to talk to, depending on the, depending on the uh, audience, mm. sometimes I uh, feel that this is an audience where I can freely discuss about sexual assaults, mm. rapes, yeah? Mm. Um, and so I bring in those slides. Mm. Uh, there are some instances where I think, okay, this is a space where domestic violence should be discussed. I, I also bring that in. Drugs and what are the offences in the drugs, uh, in our illicit uh, drugs law, and what are the sentences that they right. get. So you're really attempting to uh, resolve criminal behaviours before yes. they happen. Yes, yes. Are they, do you spend time with the parents too? Are the parents part of that thing? Or would you have a separate session with them? Oh, I, I'd go to uh, any invitation. Okay. So I've spoken to the entire congregations. Yes. Uh, where they've given me a space in the afternoon, uh, afternoon um, service. Yes. Where everybody's there. Okay. And so I'd sort of culture the, culture the presentation. Yes. So that I can talk to men and women as well about yes. what their role is towards raising uh, children, yes. so that at the same time they're aware of what are the things. Yes. Uh, I get to talk about domestic violence, which is important because everybody's everybody's involved in that yes. in that environment. Should a domestic violence event happen, right. and what are the responsibilities that we each hold, children, fathers, mothers, yes. uh, within that space. Yes, that's so good, and I love that feeling that you, because you said early on that. If we can, we should do something. And really, yes. this is your something, you know? Yeah, it really started off uh, some years ago. Uh, and this was really just, uh, at that time, it was developed for a particular school. Okay. Uh, and we just wanted to address the sorts of unruly behaviors right. that were happening at boarding school. And so I, we, we walk, I walk in and then we talk to them about, okay, so remember when you, you know when you bully somebody? Yes. It's a crime. And this is what the crime. This is what that crime is. It's called assault or assault occasionally right. actual bodily harm. And this is the sentence: when you uh, damage somebody's uh, chest box, right? It's actually damaging property, and it's a crime, and you can go to jail for wow. this. So it's to them. It's like okay. So it's not just something that happens. Right. It can be a crime as well. So they stay off it. We're able to reduce the numbers drastically after right. that. And so we just developed it from there. Uh, then I get I got invited into another youth space okay. where there was, you know, the invitation was by and large trying to reduce the amount of thefts and robberies and uh, home invasions that was happening mm. in that locality. So we started developing. Mm. So this crime doesn't pay package is not really um, wasn't something that was designed and that was, you know, cast in stone. Yes. Is we keep modifying it. It's evolving as we as we uh, you know as we go from community to community. Right. Um, and it's just a wonderful interface. Yes. And I I like how you started because I'm assuming you would have gone to QVS because your boys went there and start from there. And bullying is such a common thing. It's like when you go to a boarding school, you expect to be bullied. I mean, I can't say the same for ACS because I never. So, but even more so for the boys' schools. But then that behavior is like they're conditioned like that from school. So when they come out, they don't know any better, right? It's like a conditioning of the mind. Yeah. And so I see what you're saying by coming and telling them there, then they realize, okay, hang on. Um, you know, if this young, young, uh, this the former decides to go and take me to court, then yeah. I can go to jail. But because you said also earlier that we want to prevent it in the first place. And you, it's interesting you mentioned domestic violence. Because when you talk about aggravated robbery and then violence when they get older, that's something they must pick up from seeing in their home too. Eh? Doesn't, do you find that a lot of these things point back to the home, the environment that they're brought up in, whether it's the home or it's a boarding school where these behaviors are picked up? Is yeah. that something that you would agree with, that you found? I haven't participated in any of the studies. You right. know, these are just real life observations that right. I that I have around asking uh, you know, crimes where they are committed, having looked at briefs. Right. But it's you know it's almost always uh, the case that people 
young kids who grow up in violent environments right. uh, tend to become violent. Right. And yes. young kids who grow up seeing crimes being committed. Yes. Um, and if you know there's no intervention in between, right. that's the only thing that they they they, they know. They, they know yeah. And that's the only thing they get to do later. Yes. And so it's not even like I mean, it's logic. It makes sense logically, right? The child will see it when they're growing up, so it's likely they're going to do it when they're older, because that's the way they've been taught. Yeah. It's fascinating. I'm really interested to know, Philly. Like, do you find that there's a, a common sort of crime, if you like, or something that's become more common as of recent that you're seeing in the courts in relation to juveniles, to young people? Well, there are two specifically. They the robberies and burglaries are the ones that are usually grouped. You know, they're committed in groups. So some young kids think, you know, we need some money for the weekend. Um, we've got to buy this stuff. It's yes. trendy. It's, um, you know, it's there in the market. And they, right. you know, they begin to think about, oh, uh, what about their house? You know, it's usually right. empty. This is what we can do. And then uh, they, they get on to commit those offenses. Um, wow. It's, you know, they just find themselves in a place of opportunity. Yes, yes. I just want to ask one more question before we move on to the next phase. And this is about drugs, yeah? So, you know, as you know, I've been doing a lot of different work in, in different spaces in the community. And, you know, the drug problem is like rampant. Um, we don't talk about it enough, but it's there. And I've noticed a lot of younger people get caught up in, you know, just moving or like moving drugs around, yeah. um, not always using, mm. but what do you find, do you see a lot of cases in court of young people who get caught up in that and what kind of sentencing uh, would be related to, you know, just carrying drugs from here to there? Drug sentences now, I think since 2014, has um, gone up. Right. In other words, it's, it's very hard to find any drug offender not getting a prison sentence, really? regardless of, you know, regardless of your role, whether you are the one, you know, being asked to move it from point A to point B, um, you're the user, yes. uh, or you're the one who's, you know, behind the scenes, usually the guys who are uh, in control of these drugs are the ones if they're found yes. and that's if they're found yes. because they're usually the ones behind the scenes not not having right. any fingerprint on all of these things yes. that are being moved around so they're very uh, they're very calculative in the way they expose everybody else except themselves right okay but everybody else are the ones who front up in court you know the yes. ones who get used to paddle from point A and point B and ultimately the ones who get Okay. Uh, but, you know, there's hardly any difference now between uh, any serious demarcation of those that are being used and the ones that are using it because the problem right. is drugs. Right. And so the courts have come down hard on anybody who's involved in anything right. concerning either whether it's um, cannabis or whether it's, you know, the white the yes. substance that we now have rampant in our streets. Right. We got ice, we got heroin and cocaine. Yeah. Uh, cannabis is yes. you know, it's flourishing business at the moment. Yes. And you can see that you know, almost every second day, in every second week, right. uh, we get news of millions yes. of dollars worth of cannabis being uprooted in uh, was everywhere around the yes, team. yes. Uh, so, out of interest, do you find any of these young adults under the influence of any substance when they are, you know, when you when you're doing the whole trial? Do they say, "Oh, we were drunk," or they were, does that come out at all? I'm just curious. Oh, uh, look, why? that's almost always going to be the second excuse for committing these things. You know, I was, uh, we were at a party, we were drinking, and then you know, my friend asked me to uh, do a job for him, and, and yes. I did it unbeknowingly to me that, you know, it, there was uh, police waiting down, right. the, waiting down the street. Right. Um, but that's almost always you know, the, the case. case in every second case. Right. So interesting. Really interesting. Well, your job must be so interesting. 
Well, see, I'm trying to get myself out of it, so that's, I'm looking for another job. In fact, I already have. I'm a farmer by... I'm actually, I'm actually a, a, a farmer who's trying to uh, just being in a time suit. <laughs> Just so that everybody thinks that I'm doing something else. <laughs> so, you know, I've been, I think a lot about rehabilitation. Eh? Again, in the space of here, and I'm always wondering, okay, how, how else can we help? And now when I think about young adults, children that have gotten stuck in this space, I'm keen to understand what does rehabilitation look like? Like, as a country, do we have sufficient, what are your thoughts? Do we have sufficient rehabilitation? Does everybody go into jail? You know, I always think to myself that even if they do end up in jail, jail, the first day of jail should be the first day of rehabilitation. It should be a rehabilitative journey. That's me, somebody that's not involved in that space. But I'm interested to know what you think. Because, okay, they get to say they get convicted, which is bad, obviously, and we don't want them to be convicted. But if they are, what does it kind of look like after that? What have you seen? Have you seen the rehabilitative system support them to be better? Or can we do some work there? Mm. It's, it's always going to be a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, getting offenders not to repeat. Right. Uh, because re recidivism is, is always going to be a challenging issue for any... What's recidivism? Oh. It's when uh, people repeat, keep repeating, okay. offending, keep okay. repeat offending. Uh, whether it's the same sort of offence or the same family of offences, right. or they start off with getting an assault charge when they were young, and then they just keep becoming more right. serious criminals as they go in life. Because you know you'd be amazed. Uh, someone who's standing in the dock and then he's either being found guilty or pleading guilty to an offence and then the judge or the magistrate asks the prosecutor uh, any previous convictions and then he whips out a long rap sheet, mm. it's like four or five pages. Every offence in the Crimes Act is in that sheet. Mm. And then you realise, so how does this guy get mm. to here from the first offence? Because naturally you'd think, okay, if somebody gets sent to jail, he or she immediately thinks this will be the last time. Yes. And that's what we all would like to see. Yes. That's all we'd like to think would happen. But uh, unfortunately, that, that, that doesn't happen all the time. Mm. Because there are you know, cases of recidivism is when people just uh, think that that's the sort of life they want to be. Okay. Because there's no alternative. And that's where rehabilitation comes in. Yes. Is when our prison system uh, and for our, our juvenile offenders or our youth offenders within the system of social welfare because they're managed differently. Right. Within the system of social welfare, what are the things that they get to uh, go through yes. in order to give them a different pathway? Yes. You know, we got the boys uh, here in, in, in Fiji, uh, the youthful boy, boys offenders are at Samambula. Right. And uh, that's where they, they, if you drive past, uh, there's some little flower, I mean, uh, the gardens that right. they try and do every second day. I drive past there. I'm into urban farming. And then yes. I drive past there and I said, I could do 101 things in this yes. plot of land. And if I have young kids who are in this mm -hmm. uh, program, you know, it's just how you can really encourage them to get out of that place because it's usually a place of comfort. Yes. Because once you roll, you know, once you roll with your gang, yes. that becomes it for you. Yeah. You, know, you might, okay, one of us is in jail now, right, that's fine. Six months later, he rejoins the group. And then they, you know, they keep rolling as a group. Yes. We want to make sure that, you know, if we have a space that people, you disintegrate them and then you reintegrate them into meaningful spaces. Right. So it's, you know, we'd, I'd like to think that, um, uh, a real great um, a rehabilitation program would, you know, show them pathway and traits. Yes. Uh, not just letting, you know, teaching them plumbing and electricals, but giving them a pathway of who they can be in the right. future. Right. There are opportunities, job opportunities in New Zealand, Australia, in yes. Europe, that pay a lot more than what they would have gotten here. Yes. So that. What you're really trying to do is you open their minds to yes. what other possibilities there are in life and not just 
you know, hanging around with the boys, right. you know, committing the odd crimes in our communities, and basically just becoming a liability. Yes. So what I'm hearing you say is that there is an opportunity for us to look at other ways. Oh, absolutely. To do this, especially absolutely. With the I, I think I think the uh, rehab system just needs a wholesome review. Yes. Plus, of course, I mean, any reviews there's got to be uh, a financial aspect to it. Yes, of course. There's got to be funding, money poured into making sure that because it's also costly to yes. have prisons. Of the the com commissioner of prisons uh, last year, the year before, I can't remember, but he gave a figure of like fifty dollars or something to right. keep an inmate in jail for one day. For one day. And that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money from the public purse to be going out yes. and, and looking after prisoners. When, if we, before we even get there, if we can start creating, yes. putting funds into rehabilitating programs where they yes. get to, uh, you know, get into spaces where they can see, I, I have a life, and yes. I can channel this energy. I can channel this energy into plumbing, electricals. Uh, something yes. else or even in farming farming is a big business yes these days. yes and it's just and it just gets people to understand uh, differently from yes. where they are because the life of crime can be vicious and, yes. and it's, a, it's a vicious cycle yeah once yeah. you get into it it's really hard to come out yes that's what that's the testimony that you get from a lot of people that you know yes um, but it's not something that's impossible. No. I mean, there are really great stories about people who turn around. Yes. You know, turn around from a life of crime into a life of something else. It's that's yes. more beautiful than what they were. Before. Yeah. And you know, the more like the more you're talking, the more I'm realizing it is a huge opportunity for us to work in that space because you know, as you know, when you're in out in the open of course when we're free and we're trying to get people to okay think about things this way there's all these temptations from the world and everything else coming around them but when they are in prison there's nothing else for them to do but to really focus on rehabilitating themselves and so imagine if we can produce a whole lot of productive citizens mm. or at least on the track of doing that and coming out excited mm. as opposed to like oh my goodness because I'm thinking about repeat offenders and you you mentioned a good point you said something like you know it becomes we didn't use this word but it's almost like addictive because that's the lifestyle they're used to yeah. and I can imagine on the street I mean learning a little bit about you know the dynamics from Edwin is that when you come out of prison you kind of have like this extra stripe on your shoulder like you're a little bit more no. I don't know advanced in your yeah. street your I don't know your credibility or your whatever and how you're viewed on the street yeah. and so that can get to you it's like oh yeah okay so I've leveled up mm. in my um, status mm. here on the street and you're mm. right again so then if you go in again it's like Okay, yes, this is hard, but when I come out, I'm also, you know what, they're highly regarded in that space. Um, but imagine if we could have these programs where they come out and they, because again, you and I have talked about this the other day, and just the transformation of the mind is the key thing, eh? Because this again, like we started off talking about, something went wrong in the beginning. Yeah. You know, it's either they've seen it or they've come from an environment that wasn't, um, you know, didn't help them see things a certain way. Yeah. So their worldview, their conditioning is all one way. So now it's a process in rehabilitation of unlearning and mm. then relearning a different way. Mm. And so that we not only create a better person, but then we reduce the rates of reoffending. Eh? Yeah. Because when they come out, they're going to be you know, we, there's a lot of work that we, that people are doing in the community to try and say, okay, we need to embrace them because that reintegration process is another problem. Yeah. Eh? You know, it's like, boy, that yeah. one just came out and so the family is kind of treating like this. So yeah. that individual needs to be in a certain place mentally that first of all, they expect it, yeah. but they know how to navigate it. Yeah. Yeah? So there's a lot of different mm. intervention points. Mm. Yeah? But I think the good thing is, like there's enough smart people around to work out what to do. Yeah. And there's a lot of examples outside of Fiji. Have you seen any particular country that's got a good program for... Like, I know for the adults we have Yellow Ribbon, and that seems to be going well. Um, I've seen, I heard somebody talking about some stats of... I don't know off the top of my head what it is, but the reoffending rates have come down a little since that program, so that's um, great. But have you seen anything at all for children outside of Fiji? Does anything 
um, that's different to how we do things that might work here? I think both Australia and New Zealand run uh, very uh, successful restorative justice programs. Right. Young people are uh, being channeled out of the mainstream crimes or crimes process. Yes. Crimes, uh, as you know, I'm saying, uh, the process is when everything ends up in court. Yes. So there's usually family conferencing that's done. There's usually a diversion program that's right. done prior to. We have we have we have a, a hybrid of that in Fiji because we have our juvenile bureau within yes. the Fiji Police Force. And so that's where they get to determine whether this should go to the courts or not. Ah, you know, okay. there's that space or that, uh, that stop, stop place where they, you know, they conference and they think, okay, let's talk to the parents first. Let's consider the okay. alternatives to this, this boy or this young girl. Um, and so I think that's, that's also helping Right. That's also helping uh, to stall the numbers of cases of young offenders. When I say young offenders, uh, 17 and below, they're right. really just called youth right. offenders. Right. Uh, and so the model of restorative justice in both Australia and New Zealand, uh, I think we, we ran a pilot of it in Fiji in, uh, if I'm not wrong, 2004, 2005 quite possibly 2006. And then uh, the program is probably pulled uh, after, the, after the military takeover in mm -hmm. December 2006. Mm -hmm. At the time, I was still at the Legal Aid Commission. I was director at the Legal right. Aid Commission. So we were working with uh, a specialist that had come from Australia to try and kind of set up the restorative justice within right. our court system. Right. Uh, it's, but that's a huge, you know, it's a huge system in itself mm. that we need to develop. We need to know the main players in it. You know, the community leaders are going to be involved. Right. Parents are going to be involved. Right. The police are going to be involved. But really, it's a diversion program. It's an right. early diversion program right. before kids start hitting the courts. And then if, after that, we really don't know what's going to happen to them. Some yes. of them will go to prison and then come back rehabilitated. They right. learn their lesson and they say never again. Right. Some of them would come back and then you know they'd get this feeling, okay, now I have one strike. Right. Maybe second one would earn me a little bit more street respect. Right. Right. And they just keep going on that track. Right. Different people have different stories. Yes. Um, but we get to do what we need to do. Yes. And that was part of the whole program with Crime Doesn't Pay is to intervene early yes. in the lives of these young people to yes. say really it doesn't yes. uh, and you know if we can help as much as we can if we can put you know pull one of these uh, boys or girls out of a possible crime that they were intending to commit yes we're successful just in that little step yeah and if we go to 20 communities uh, one each we're able to save that's, that's right 20. Yes, I like that because sometimes it can seem so overwhelming, but if we can just do what we can, yes. like one at a time, yes. one life at a time, um, and then that has a little, you know, just a little bit more impact, better yeah. than not doing anything at all. Yeah. And that's, I didn't know about that, that uh, intervention before it actually gets to court. But um, again, I, I think that's, there's a huge, huge opportunity there too, because there's a rehabilitation required there, right? Like, because it's already done something, it shows that something is wrong. So yeah. yes, talking with the parents, but then even these programs at that uh, level, we yeah. don't have enough. And it's exciting to me to think that there is opportunity to do something. Not, yeah. it isn't, I've learned now in this journey um, that rather than looking at things in a way to say, oh, this is so depressing, there's nothing there. Yeah. Like if we look at it and say like, oh, there's an opportunity here. And then we, because we're a developing country, I always think we have an advantage in that developed countries have done so much before us, so we just kind of pick and choose. Yeah. And you said even Australia and New Zealand, they're just close to us. Yeah. I've seen some programs, um, and uh, I watched one in Europe, you know how Europe is so advanced in everything, and they're one of their prisons, I can't remember what country it was, they have like state-of-the-art machinery to learn how to be mechanics. They've got the best music instruments. If they find that people are more, you know, inclined to be musicians, 
everything they have is just the best of the best and they train them that way. So of course that requires a lot of money and there's been a lot of you know people in the country that have been like, why are you doing this? Why are you wasting money on them? But then they've shown their reoffending rates are just practically right. nothing. Right. Right. Because they come out confident, but they've not only got skills, but skills that are relevant to that time. And that's another problem. Because it's like, okay, we're equipping them with this, but the world has moved on. Yeah. And we are still teaching them how to use a cane knife and whatever, yeah. when people are harvesting cane with different machines. Right. And so, again, there's plenty we can learn from. And yes. it's exciting to think of what our country could be. Yeah. Yeah? Now, I want to move on into culture. So... You would have heard me talk about um, Mele's um, interview, the young girl who got raped. Um, and so I went on and did a little bit of research around the rape statistics and yes, found a shocking number of rapes. Um, I just looked at the June stats from, and the DPP's office has got a lot of great stats, right? Oh yeah, they have. Yeah. They, and each month they churn yeah. out a graph that, you know, uh, quite apart from providing us the necessary information, it's uh, depressing to look at. Yes, it is depressing. And I've been posting a lot of it and uh, someone, one person said to me, I think I'm going to unfollow you on Twitter because your information is just, just depressing. And I'm like, but this is the state of our country. It's important for us as everyday citizens to know. And so when looking at rape in particular, so far, like we're just six months into the year, we already have over 200 reported rapes. Uh, what I've also learned from doing a bit of reading is that it's, 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 there's only about 30% of rapes that actually get reported. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we work that out, then that's like hundreds and hundreds mm -hmm. more. Okay? Now, one of the papers I read, because I was trying to understand why aren't we reporting it? You know, I don't, I don't know why you wouldn't report it. Again, because I come from a very different environment, so just trying to understand the thinking. And I was really surprised to learn that in our culture, because we have the mbulu, where we do that you know, traditional apology, um, a lot of the time the families are saying, well, we feel like we cannot report it because the mbulu has been done. Right. And so as a lawyer, I'm interested to, and then it's okay, I'm interested to know how you feel about that. Is that right, that when the mbulu is done, we just stop? Or what, do you, what should the process be? Well, the mulu mulu doesn't, uh, doesn't remove the culpability. Right. We just need to put that, you know, we just need to make sure that that's clear. It, it doesn't erase it. Yes. It doesn't remove the criminal offense that has happened. Yes. What it does is it, it provides an acknowledgement. Right? So the mulu mulu is really somebody who's come to the girl's family, with his family, um, to say what is done is wrong and he's sorry. Right. Whether it's accepted or not, uh, that's not really up to this lot. It's, that's up to the, you know, to the victim's right. lot. Uh, but even if they accept it, even if, for example, they accept it, you know, it happens in a, in a close familiar environment, yes. or, where they just feel obligated, okay, I'll, I'm just going to accept this tambua because, you know, it's traditional to accept it. Yes. That doesn't mean that that crime should not be reported. Every instance of sexual assault needs to be reported to the police. Yes. Because remember, the mulumulu might be done for the purpose of the offender. Yes. The trauma is always going to be there for the victim. And the yes. mulumbulu doesn't remove it. Yes. The mulumbulu is proper, uh, con in, in the proper context of the mulumbulu, is to show remorse. Remorse right. is something that is right. going to be taken into account in a court of law. It has a place in a court of law. Okay. When a guy pleads guilty and he goes before a judge and says, I, you know, reconciled with the family or sought forgiveness from the family. Yes. That's something that you are offering to the judge as part of your mitigation. Okay. But it yeah. doesn't remove the criminality. It's then up to the judge whether he or she considers that to be a mitigating factor. Right. Right. 
So for families who, who know who are get, do get approached with uh, tambua, one or two tambua, and somebody's come to ask forgiveness for a sexual offense, it's traditional uh, with Itauke families to, you know, to, to uh, be involved in a, in a bulu bulu. Yes. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't report it. In fact, you should. Yes. Because that's already a show that the guy has accepted criminal responsibility. Right. So for part of the show is we'd like to, you know, encourage. And yes. encourage families, with or without Mulumbu, that when a sexual assault of any nature that has happened, yes. it needs to be reported. Yes. Because the only way in which we get to, you know, ultimately send out a community message is to tell people that what has happened is wrong. Yes. That just needs to come up clearly, and the courts have come up clearly, uh, to denounce sexual assaults of yes, any kind. Yes, yes. Uh, we need to do our part. The courts yes. are doing their part, we have to do our part. Yes, that's so good. I'm glad you clarified that, because you said, and this is so important, that the trauma is not removed. Like, we don't often think of the victim when all of this is done. It's kind of what I was reading, that there was a lot of um, concern over the relationship between families and Bonua and yeah. all of that. And so the males in the family kind of like, okay, it's done. There's no need for us to go and expose ourselves like that. Right. But the victim is still the victim and there's been no justice for the victim. And yeah. so we have a responsibility yeah. to report it, with or without the Murumuru. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I like that. So I hope that is really clear because there's been a lot of conversation about that. So please, Bulumuru or non Bulumuru, especially for our sexual crimes, yeah. they need to be reported. And I think, I believe fully that this is also important to protect others, you know, because once we start to, you know, um, expose this and expose the, you know, the perpetrators. And it's important for the protection of our community as a whole yeah. to be reported. Yeah. So I want to um, ask about your family in particular. So you have quite a big family of your own. Yeah. You have a lot of young adults in your <laughs> space. and <About> 101. <laughs> <laughs> and there's always things happening. You've got like young, young girls, and then you've got your older, young adult boys, and then boys been to boarding school. So, you know, that's, that's you, Philly, before you're a lawyer or before you're trying to help any, anyone else, right? So your first, um, your place of ministry, I guess, or your place of work is in your family. So I'm really interested to know, like for, uh, for me as a parent, what sort of things do you do or what have you learned um, in terms of parenting where you can kind of help your kids not end up, you know, in, yeah. in, a, you know, in a life of crime? Because like you said, they just slip into it. You know, yeah. a lot of the time the young kids slip into it. So what, what are some things that you and Sarah might do or teachings that you implement that could help us? Yeah. Maybe first tell us about your children, how many you have and their ages. And I, what I said, no, I'm not going to say what I, but Margaret's always, when we, uh, when Margaret and Siti and I talk, uh, say hi in the morning, Margaret would say, oh, hi, Philly, and you're 101 <laughs> children at your home. But Sarah and I uh, started, started raising uh, boys even before we got our first biological one. Really? Um, so my sister had two boys at QBS, and so we'd started, we'd just got married. Uh, in fact, we had Elijah, uh, who was barely one year old, and then we had two boys who come from the village, uh, my sister's children, to come to QBS, and so we started looking after them, the Mickey and Ben. Uh, they're now in the States. Uh, both have their families, uh, both working, um, and so we have six children of our own, three boys and three girls, in that order. Right. Uh, but apart from the six, we had Mackie and Ben, and then we also had Mary, uh, right. who's my older brother's uh, daughter. Um, when he passed away, we said, okay, we'll get Mary um, to come and live with us. Mary is now uh, a HR personnel in uh, Wellington. Nice. 
So he's, she's, you know, she's got a life of her own. Yes. Um, that's nine children. That's really nine. Seven. Oh, Six not finished plus. yet. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so we have, uh, and then we have Sarah, who's my uh, um, brother-in-law's daughter. Mm -hmm. uh, and we looked after Sarah when she was very small. And then at the moment we have uh, one of our my sister's uh, daughter who's attending university, and uh, uh, Sarah's siblings. Yes. Two boys. Uh, now one at grandma and one at Maris. Right. Maris, Maris uh, Primary School, I think. Maris. What's it called? Super Street. Maris Super Street. Street. Maris Super Street. Yeah. Uh, two boys at QVS, one girl at Grandma, and two girls at Bilto. Right. So, so there's actually always... 13 children that's being raised in the Wasserong household at the moment. Some in boarding school. And yeah, this. and uh, two in America, one in... Yes. Um, one in um, Wellington. Wellington. Okay, mm. so the boys are in boarding school. Two are in boarding school. Yes. Uh, Elijah is now at university. Right. And uh, Sarah and Marcy are in uh, QBS. Okay. okay. Saralini is the, the oldest of the girls, uh, is in grammar. Okay. I thought that she'd go to ACS, but. But no. Mother says no. So what sort of things do you and uh, Sarah do to kind of, you know, I mean, that's a, that's a handful. Like I've only got two children and I'm stressed half the time on how to make sure that we are delivering the right teaching. But what sort of things yeah. do you do? Yeah, it's hard. But I'd say it's hard only for a while. Okay. Because once you start getting, uh, you know, the family setting, once you start getting them on a roll of a, of a let's say, a week's program, one of the things that we find, main, you know, contributes to maintaining you know, that family stability, yes. and then you know also acts as a pool for the wayward one. Yes. You know, you begin to see signs of mm, right, right. What is he doing? What is she doing? But family meetings are very important. I see. For for Sarah and I, family meetings are very important okay. when we sit down with our children, uh, and. And they know that Elijah knows, Mary, when she comes from New Zealand, she knows that in that setting, they're all children. Right. right. And we are the ones that are responsible for giving them guides on how life should be. What's your contribution to this family? Yes. When you go out and interface with your friends, you are going out as a part of us. Yes. So anything that you do outside there that that is not from here means that you know you're really just breaking tradition with what we call her. Right, right. So we're really teaching them responsibility very early. Yes. They get to know their identity, their part of family DNA right. that maintains stability and order in the family. Get to know what you're supposed to do yes. in a given day. Yes. We give them a routine of what is expected of them. Yes. And then we follow up. Okay. So the next afternoon when we meet, or the next morning when we meet, we'd say, how did that uh, thing that I told you about, right. how did it go? Right, right. But one of the things that I realized, Liliana, uh, that contributes to the breakdown of this community fabric yes. that we're supposed to have is parents who just don't have the time right. anymore for their kids. Or parents that prioritize other, other things. things yeah. we're, we're working parents and uh, I'm, I need 28 hours a day just to mm. make ends meet. Mm. But when it comes to that space, my children know that that's the most important. Yes. That sitting down with them, or just isolating the boys, and I see mm, the boys are not right. pulling. You know that, not pulling up. So I isolate them, and I say, get in the car. Right. Let's go for a drive. Nice. I will sit somewhere. We just sit, and we are in this intimate space where we're discussing issues of manhood. Yes. And we're discussing issues of leadership. 
Yes. Uh, but I, I'd want to think that when they hear what I'm saying, that they are not just hearing, they're also seeing You're right. That's what good. I'm telling them. Yes. So I don't want them to go and say, oh, Dad said this just because Dad said this. Yes. I want them to see and say, yep, I know. Yes. That's him. You know, I want them to see me as right. the leader who's doing what I'm asking them to do. Yes. You know, it gives them, it gives them not just a responsibility, but I think it gives them that energy. Right. To do the right thing. Yes. So I'd pull them up and I'd say, Cyril, uh, this is not this is not the results that we are thinking we should be getting. Yes. What's the problem? And then he says, Oh, I've got responsibility. Uh, because he's a house captain at QBS. Mm -hmm. I got this to have to look after and say, okay, let's try and uh, manage the space in one day. And let's try and find that one hour where you can pull nice. up those lessons. Nice. Okay. Masi, how's it this coming along? And so you you're not talking down at them? Yes. You're talking with them. Yes. And so you're alongside them yeah. in this journey. Yeah. yeah. And we'd like to think that every once in a while they need to be pulled. Yes. And you know stern stern teachings have to happen yes but yes. not all the time you know there's got to be a space where the kids should feel uh safe to say their weakness right and be accepted yes right and so yes. we're saying the law why didn't you do this yesterday and the first thing that she probably would want to say is i was watching tv and that she realizes that if I say this, right. that's something that she was banned from. Right. And they will say, tell me, you're not going to get any punishment. Right. And then she says, oh, I was watching TV. Right. right. So let's deal with that. Okay. Let's just deal with that disobedience. Yes. And let's context that disobedience to everybody else. Right. And why that disobedience doesn't help everybody else. Okay. And so then she says, okay, yeah, I get it. Right. So you know when, when we mostly, or you know, for Christians, yes. we say spare the rod, spoil the child. The rod is not. Yes. The rod is not this. Yes. The rod is really, you know, the the the, the teaching that comes down yes. comes up from you. Yes. It's really what you direct them with. Because the right. rod is a pointer. Yes. The pointer is you. Right. Your life is the pointer. So if you start talking to them about if you're talking to them about obedience, they have to see that you're also obeying somebody else. I've got, yes. I have people that I report to. Right. You know, within the family context, I've got that older brothers. To yeah. yes. I've got older brothers. And they know that when my eldest brother gets into the family space, yes. they know that the lawyer, high profile father that they had knows his place. Yes. He's the little brother now. Yeah. Yes. In our church community, they know where I am and how I report to the eldership. Right. And they know that line is very direct and yes. has, you know, is, is full of respect. Right. And so once they see that, then they don't have any problem. Yes. Of course, they, of course being, young, you know, being a young child, you get to yeah. try and find your way around. But yes. our job is to guide. Yes. And guidance is what, as I said, a lot of things that are happening in our communities in juvenile cases, yes. in youth cases that comes before the court. Yes. Because there's a lot of interaction that happens. The juvenile magistrate will get the parents here next time. Yes. When the parents come in, the parents are usually the sureties for the, for the offender. Mm -hmm. right? And then sometimes they get asked, are you able to provide surety, make sure that he uh, turns to court the next time and doesn't reoffend within between now and then when I give my decision. Some parents would say, what happens to me if he doesn't follow the conditions? That's how far remote a father and son are. That he can't even trust his own son to keep you know to keep to the bail conditions. Yes. And then you get to realize when you when you go into you know because we all here on a uh, men's meeting that side, women's meeting that side, yes. all happening in one week and everybody's and then when you get to their home, it's nobody's there. Just the kids by yes. themselves. Doing what they want to do. Yes. Hanging out with friends they they have. Out in open streets. And then you get you know, you ask yourself the question, what can we do? Well for parents, 
one of the things we need to do is start prioritizing right. time with our children right. as the most important. We need to find that time. Yes. Regardless of how busy we are, we yes. need to find that time. Because it's our responsibility, right? Yeah. Yes. yes Sometimes yes. even, I mean, we've got places where one of us is in Suva and one of us is out of town. And yes. I'm in a meeting else, elsewhere. There's Zoom that you can yes. get to talk to your children and then there's always... So the, the, the sort of environment that I personally would want to create in my own family space is that when I'm not there, I'm still there. Right. right. They know. They feel me around the house. Yes. They know there are things that dad wants to do. Yes. This is not something that I can do. Yes. And that's it. You know, I can't negotiate with, uh, with my parents about this. Yes, I can negotiate with this, but it comes with responsibility. Right. You can go out with friends, but this is a time in which you come back. Yes. That's the sort of space that they are, they're relatable to us, yes. but they also know that they, you know, it comes with responsibility right. to be somebody's uh, daughter or son. Yes. Well, that's a lot of great stuff, Phoebe. You gave us so much in that thing. Just, I mean, if, if you, somebody who is as busy as you, can manage to parent well, I don't see what excuse we have. And you've given some really important uh, factors. Like, first of all, make time. Because someone keeps on the word find time. I always say to people, I have to find time for this. And one of my friends said to me, you don't find time, you need to make time. Mm -hmm. And you say, this is the time for this. And you make the time and you commit to it. And especially for our children. And I think because we, we are not taught that way really when we're growing up. Because we are parented differently. Mm -hmm. So we don't realize what a huge responsibility parenting is. Eh? And all the stuff that we've been talking about, when we wind it right back down, the breakdown comes from that. Yeah. that um, you know, like you mentioned, the fabric. And really, uh, families are the fabric of our nation, of our community. So what we're seeing in, you know, in crime and all these other social issues can really be brought right back to the family set right. up there. Um, I like that you also mentioned something about, you know, having a routine. And so it's like, it's important to put parameters around. And I've also learned that kids need parameters for them to learn because then, Sadly, now they've got so much freedom, they've got access to so much information. So, us as parents have responsibility to give them parameters to, to grow up in. Yeah? And the punishment part is, is also another significant thing because I think what you've managed to do in this short piece that we just talked about is talk about the culture, um, being a professional um, person, um, but also the church. And I think that's where we often break down too, like mm. especially for us Christians, because it's kind of like, oh, the Bible says this, and then, but the Vanua says this, and then, but as a parent, so where does, where, where do I fit? And then things just get all confused, and then next yeah. thing, kids just end up bringing themselves up. And that verse that's often referred to, my daughter uh, made an interesting statement once. She said, you know, the spare the rod, spoil the child, the rod in that context was in reference to, you know, the shepherd, like in the Bible, there's a shepherd yeah. and a sheep. And so the shepherd always has the rod. Yeah. The shepherd does not hit the sheep. He guides, guides the sheep like this. And that's exactly, you know, what you said. Our role is to guide, is to hold them accountable. But I think, again, the, probably the most important thing from making time is walking the talk. Yeah. Because I think a lot of us too are brought up just kind of being told what to do and then we are observing something else. Because yeah. like we started off with kids, they will mimic what they see. And so we've been talking about a lot of the negative things that they've seen and ended up in crime. But imagine if they were seeing these positive things. Like imagine, you know, what the next generation could look like yeah. if they had all of these positive um, influences around them, the mm. positive examples. Because it's easier to pick up when you see it. It's like, okay, if dad said this, maybe this means this, and I try this. And then you're like, no, that's not what it means. And then the poor child is like, well, what does it actually mean? Because yeah. they're not seeing it. Eh? Yeah. So that's just, it's such a significant thing. So thank you for that, uh, Philly. Mm. And sorry, just lastly, that safe space that you talked about, like with your daughter. Um, and I want to mention that specifically because that's key. Because a lot of the like stuff, the conversation we're having with pornography, um, a big challenge that parents are having is having the conversation and what does that sound like and um, I've had the conversation with my, uh, my children, like our conversations are quite open and a lot of people have asked me, 
like what do you say and how do you say it and do you sit them down and it just gets awkward like it's it's going to be very difficult for you to bring up a serious topic like that when you haven't created that environment of an open communication like this is safe you know if it's something you've seen it's okay so you can't start having that thing at 17 years old and then try and talk about why pornography is bad for you like from when they're young we need to intentionally create the space of open communication and it's safe mm. and okay if you watch tv like with my son our, ours is a playstation right he wasn't supposed to play and then he played without us knowing that kind of thing and so then just okay it's okay now how come was it not enough time and then it'll be something like oh but my friends were all playing at that time yeah. and i really want to you know these are normal things for kids yeah. they will make mistakes they will fail and that's a part of life and we just need to walk alongside them yes mm. so thank you philly that's huge remember so, we all made mistakes when we were young well i don't so know about you guys start. i didn't make any mistakes when i was <laughs> <right>. <laughs> So we all disobeyed Liliana, <laughs> we all disobeyed. That's true, that's very true. So just to end, I've taken so much of your time this morning. This has gone longer than I intended, but the conversation was so good. Thank you for making that time. I just wanted to ask whether you could let the viewers know if they wanted you to come and speak to them, what is the best way if you want to speak to them? Because you can also speak to family groups, right? You're not restricted in where you're going to speak. Um, Anybody. Get together. Yeah. So, how do any, we, how does any, that happen? Any setup that, you know, they feel that uh, they want me to come and talk to them about uh, present laws uh, that affect uh, their young young people in their communities. I can, yes. I'm more than uh, happy to come and help. Right. Um, you just provide the venue and the electricity. Right. And uh, we'd be there come and set up uh, the slides, the PowerPoint uh, presentation and then, you know, it's a very informal uh, sessions that yes. I have, um, yeah, I'm happy to do any community, uh, community uh, visits. Right. So can they just contact you through your page on Facebook? Your, is it okay to message through there or what's the yeah, way yeah. of the yeah, they, Message me. Yes. Or, or now that you are, you're going. To, now you're responsible for bringing that into your show. So if they contact me, if they if they uh, contact you, then. So do you see what you did there? You just sent me from the celebrity into the secretary just in one moment. That was that was my intention all along. I got it the final minute. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks so much, Philly. And I wanted to also encourage those of you in the professional community. Um, you just heard how we ended there. Even those parents, like we often know Philly as the lawyer and the politician, but he's also a great father. He's a great husband, I'm sure. Well, we'll, we'll have to ask Sarah that. But please reach out to him too. Like I, I find it also interesting how you, again, just navigating the professional space, trying to make time for our kids and all of that. And I'm sure he'll be very, very happy to just share what he's learned. Of course, he's made mistakes as well, we all have, and just to share how he's learned along the way. But Philly, thank you so much. Thank you so much for encouraging us today. Thank you for the support that you've been to me and Edwin, to both you and Sarah, and really you've inspired not only us, but so many people just in your journey, in the way you live your life is just so impressive. So I also wanted to just encourage you and bless you, and just thank you for being you, Philly. Thank you very much. So thank you viewers for joining us this evening and I hope you enjoyed that. I really enjoyed that conversation. There's more to come and please remember to just always share it. If you enjoyed it, share it because this is going to help somebody else. And again, we're educating ourselves, we're empowering ourselves, but we're also understanding what we can do as individuals. Philly really started off with that. Like what can you do with what you have? You know, whether you're a professional or you're at home or you're a businessman or woman, all of us have something that we can do to just really help our children thrive, whether they're your biological children or not. So anyway, thank you again so much. I will see you um, next week, same time, 8 p.m. on Saturday, uh, 8 p.m. Fiji time on Saturday.